People experience a range of phobias, defined as a blend of an intense fear and the urge to avoid some object or activity. So for example, they might experience a fear or phobia of some animals, such as spiders, snakes, and dogs. So what do you think motophobia is? Well, motophobia is the fear of moths or butterflies. Now, people can also experience fear of the natural environment, such as lightning, thunder, or the dark. So for example, what do you think botanophobia is? Well, botanophobia is the fear of plants. People can also fear common situations such as flying or heights. So what do you think Frigga triscodecaphobia is? Well, Frigga, well, whatever that word is, is the fear of Friday the 13th. And in addition, people can fear bodily incursions such as injections or blood. So for example, what do you think halitophobia is? Well, halitophobia is the fear of bad breath because halitosis means bad breath. So in this video, I'll discuss how the concept of classical conditioning can partly, but not wholly, explain these fears. To illustrate, around 1920, a renowned scientist, John Watson, and his assistant, Rosalie Raynor, conducted one of the most famous and controversial studies to examine fear. In particular, for three months, they studied a young boy who was nine months old at the beginning of this study. Now, they didn't disclose the real name of this child, but they called him Little Albert in publications. Now, at the beginning of this study, Little Albert didn't seem to fear any objects in his environment, such as dogs or rabbits or, or rats or coats or anything. And the experimenters would then present Little Albert with a white rat. And every time they presented the white rat, they would then hit an iron bar with a hammer evoking a loud and unpleasant sound. And in response to this sound, Albert would cry, manifesting fear. And eventually, after little Albert was exposed to this sequence of the rat and then the noise many times, the rat, even by itself, would evoke the same crying and fear. And this sequence of events is an example of classical conditioning. The loud noise is an, what we call an unconditioned stimuli. That is, this stimulus or event naturally or innately evoked fear. Whereas the white rat was initially what we call a neutral stimulus. That is, this stimulus or event didn't naturally or innately evoke any strong response initially. But this white rat often preceded the loud noise and thus was conditioned to evoke fear. And so hence, the white rat was eventually called the conditioned stimulus. Now, furthermore, this fear actually generalized beyond the white rat. Little Albert, for example, eventually began to fear some other small white animals as well. Of course, this study, although important, is obviously now regarded as unethical. And the mother of little Albert was actually a wet nurse at the local hospital. That is, she would breastfeed other newborns at the hospital. And some reports indicate that she actually didn't know that little Albert had been subjected to these experiments. And other reports, in contrast, indicated that she more felt coerced to consent to this study. Indeed, nobody knows what actually happened to little Albert afterwards. Uh, some investigators believe he was a boy named Douglas Merritt, who died a few years later from hydrocephalus, which is like basically water on the brain. So we don't know whether his fears persisted. Um, other investigators believe he was called William Barger, a man who actually died at 87 and expressed a phobia of dogs later in life. But investigations on this matter have been ambiguous. Although unethical, the study did seem to imply that fears could be ascribed to classical conditioning. However, as many authors have shown, the features of typical fears actually tend to diverge from the features of classical conditioning. So first, according to the principles of classical conditioning, objects need to precede some aversive stimulus several times, perhaps between say five and 15 times, before individuals will fear this object. So little Albert, for example, had to observe the white rat and then hear the unpleasant noise several times before developing the fear. But in practice, fears tend to develop more rapidly than studies on classical conditioning would predict.
Fear can actually develop from one aversive experience with, for example, a rat or dog. Indeed, in some instances, fears can develop even if the person had never experienced aversive experiences with this object or event. So people who have never been in a plane, for example, can actually develop a fear of flying. Second, people and some animals can be conditioned to develop fears of some objects more rapidly than other objects. So for example, if people watch a snake and then hear a loud noise, and if this sequence is, say, repeated three times, they might develop a fear of snakes. But in contrast, if people watch a ball and then hear a loud noise, and this sequence is repeated, say, three times, they might not develop a fear of balls. So experiences alone can't really explain fears, because the experience with the snake and the ball were identical. Instead, we seem to be biologically programmed to develop fears of some objects, like snakes, more rapidly than fears of other objects, like balls. In particular, we seem to be biologically programmed to rapidly develop fears of objects that were harmful to our ancestors, such as snakes, spiders and illnesses. Third, according to classical conditioning, if the aversive experience no longer follows the object, the fear should diminish over time. For example, if little Albert was often exposed to the white rat, but without the loud noise, eventually the fear should subside. That is, psychologists would say the fear should extinguish. But in practice, fears do not subside or extinguish as rapidly as anticipated. These fears persist even if the object seldom, if ever, precedes an aversive experience like loud noise. So in practice, fears can't be entirely ascribed to classical conditioning. Other explanations or mechanisms need to be considered. Now one mechanism is called rule-based learning. According to classical conditioning and operant conditioning, we extract rules from experiences. For example, little Albert gradually learned that white rats precede unpleasant noises, or, or likewise we might learn that acting rudely tends to precede disapproval. However, humans can also use language to communicate and to learn these rules. So rather than learn that white rats precede unpleasant noises from many experiences, we could simply be told that white rats are dangerous, and this information alone can evoke a fear. Similarly, rather than learn that acting rudely tends to precede disapproval, we could be told that if you act rude, people will not like you. And again, this information alone can deter people from acting rudely. So therefore, language enables individuals to learn fear and other rules more rapidly and without the need to experience adversity such as loud noises. So for a moment, you might feel that the classical conditioning and operant conditioning are actually futile. That is, you might feel that we can learn everything we need just using language to communicate rules to our children, for example. You might feel that this source of learning is more efficient. But unfortunately, the rules that we learn from language tend to be somewhat inflexible because we can't as readily articulate all of the complications and caveats. We can't as readily say, look, don't act rudely unless the other person is rude and they're junior, or because you're acting, or because, and so forth. That is, these complexities are hard to articulate or remember. Yet with experience and thus classical conditioning and operant conditioning, we can gradually learn all of these complications. And so our behaviour becomes more appropriate rather than rigid. So therefore, although language is very helpful, our experiences in some setting culminates in a more appropriate repertoire of responses and behaviours. Now, as implied earlier, some of our innate or natural tendencies can also influence the impact of classical conditioning. That is, we program to learn some associations more rapidly than other associations. So for example, we readily learn to associate specific tastes, such as the taste of sprouts, with nausea. So to illustrate, suppose that three times after we eat sprouts, we also just happen to experience nausea, but only because we were infected with a stomach bug at the same time. Nevertheless, in the future, the sprouts alone might elicit nausea. That is, two or three occasions might be sufficient to elicit this aversion to sprouts. But now instead suppose that 
three times after we eat sprouts, we instead hear unpleasant noises and thus experience fear. But in the future, the sprouts alone might not elicit fear. In other words, we learn to associate the sprouts with nausea more rapidly than we learn to associate the sprouts with fear. But how can we explain these findings? Well, that is how or well, why do we learn the association between sprouts and nausea more rapidly than we learn the association between sprouts and fear, for example? Well, arguably, the association between sprouts and nausea is more adaptive during the evolution of humans. That is, nausea protects humans from contaminated foods. In contrast, the association between sprouts and fear is probably not as adaptive. Fear is not really an appropriate response contaminated foods. Therefore, we might be programmed to learn some associations more rapidly than other associations. We might, for example, be biologically prepared to learn the association between contaminated food and nausea more rapidly than between contaminated food and fear. Likewise, we might be more biologically prepared to learn the association between snakes and fear than between balls and fear. So language and biological preparedness partly explains why the development of fears can diverge from the features of classical conditioning. And furthermore, classical conditioning might explain some examples of fear, but doesn't really explain other features of phobias as well, and that is the fun function of avoidance. That is, if experience or people experience a phobia, such as a phobia of spiders, they're not only susceptible to fear, but they also avoid these objects as well. And apparently classical condition doesn't really explain this avoidance as well. Whereas other mechanisms such as operant condition probably explain this avoidance better, although I'm not gonna substantiate this claim now. Finally, another account could also explain why the experience of little Albert might differ from the development of fears in daily life. And that is the study of little Albert may have actually been quite flawed. The details of this study were not recorded unambiguously and clearly. So researchers today are not entirely sure which stimuli were used to provoke the fear or which stimuli little Albert actually did learn to fear. Indeed, some evidence indicates that little Albert might have exhibited aberrations because of this hydrocephalus, that excess fluid in the brain. And the results therefore might not be observable in other children.